Ray so headline Allen. for this whole redraft is Chad Ford once again selects Darko. Yeah. <laughs> Who better to come in for the 2003 draft, the redraftables, and Chad Ford? I mean, it's one of the three most famous drafts of our lifetime, right? I would say 84, 96, 03. Would those be the top three for you? I agree. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, LeBron is obviously our first pick. I would say um, probably the greatest, him and Tim Duncan, the greatest two number one picks of the last 25 years. Then if you're going back 30 years, now you throw Shaq in there. Um, Kareem going back to 1970. It's, it's funny how the, the greatest pick being the actual first overall pick is not something that happens quite as often as you think it would, but this is certainly not a thing. This is when try when you're thinking about, Oh man, if we win the lottery, what's the best case scenario? This was the best case Scenario: The three best players of all time are him, Russell, and Jordan. He's the only one that goes first. So you got that. All right, you're on the clock. Cleveland took that pick, obviously, and brought poor LeBron into a team that had Ricky Davis and was just a train wreck, and they figured it out. Uh, you're on the clock with Detroit. Um, I, you can do this either way. You can do it. Who is the best player? Um, or you can be who should who should Detroit have been taken? I'll let you do both versions. I think in both ways, the guy they missed was Wade. Yeah. And the guy that actually could have come in, fit their culture, fit the the type of player that Joe Dumars and the Pistons really loved, a guy that was more ready, perhaps in this case off the bench, to right. contribute to a Pistons team right away, that you know even Bosch didn't make perfect sense there because I actually think Bosch would have fallen into the same trap that Darko had fallen into. I don't think Larry Brown was playing Chris Bosh either. If he wasn't going to play Darko, he also wasn't going to play Chris Bosh. And and we may have a very, very different story to tell about Chris Bosh if he had gone to. I think Dwayne Wade would have earned minutes on this team. I don't know that it would have been the best for his career the way Miami was. But I certainly think that that, that player, both in retrospect and even now thinking about it at the time and what Detroit needed and what they could have used was the pick for them all the way. It's an incredible what if, because if they do take him, they win the title next year anyway, but basically he's getting all the Lindsey Hunter minutes and, you know, he's, I guess the sixth man, but somebody who's so athletic, you could play three guards. You could play him with Billups and Hamilton um, or just spell them. But basically you would have three unbelievable guards at all time. The the one-on-one stuff that he would have been able to do would really help them. He was incredible defensively back then. That would have helped them. And then down, you know, it probably opens the door for them to probably pursue. Do they trade rip, you know, a year later or two years later or something like that, that Oh four team though, if you put him on that Oh four team, that's an insane team. That might've been an all time team. Once they added Rashid. It's uh, a, it's a dynasty. I actually think. In yeah, because they they were really good anyway. I, I was looking back when we did the Tayshawn draft, the amount of playoff games he played in, that team was playing like 18 to 25 playoff games a year for like five, six years. They made two finals. They won one. But yeah, I mean, if you just, if you switch Darko and Wade, that has to at least spin two titles. Plus the league was pretty weak back then. You know, 05, 06, 07 range. It was not, it was pretty talent poor from that point. All right, I'm up at number three. I, I did. My scouts did look at Chris Bosch for a while. We brought him in. We talked to him. You like um, him? We thought about him for Denver, the stability, and um, and also how the Carmelo era actually did work out in Denver. But I'm I'm probably more pro Carmelo than most. I I don't want to say I'm a stand for Carmelo, but I I am a I would say a defender. Um, I said in the draft hour I wrote at number three, Denver happily takes the MJ to Darko Sam Bowie. Um, he did not turn out to be MJ, but I do think there's a roadmap that he could. And I made this case. I wrote a column a few years ago about it. There's a roadmap where he could have been 2011 Dirk for a title team, where if you'd built the right kind of veteran, awesome defense kind of team with him just as the scorer, it might've worked. And it, and to be honest, it almost did in 09 because they was 2-2 against the Lakers in the conference finals. They had that run with Kmart and Nene and Chauncey Billups, all those guys. And that year he was 27, 6 and 4, 45% uh, field goal, nine free throws, 
a game, and this is, you know, for eight weeks and the seven weeks in the playoffs, not much different than what Dirk's stats were in 2011. So I'm still a believer. I think it's, I think if you get a guy that did all the stuff Carmelo did in his career with the third pick, you're doing pretty well. I think you're actually right. I think that there's so much about his legacy that is tainted by being on those poor teams later on and questioning whether he's a winner. And even though he won the title at Syracuse, I think this is also a guy who had to live up to incredible hype as well. And, you know, you look at the, the win shares for LeBron and they're 236 and for Carmelo, they're 102. And just the expectation that he was going to be the guy instead of just looking at what he actually was, which was a really good basketball player. And I do think the perception, if they had won that series, that 2-2 series, if they had won that series, I think we may start thinking about and talking about Carmelo in a completely different way. Denver probably Agreed. does something different. And his career just takes a different a different tack than, than how it ended up. And this is yet another example of, unless you're LeBron James or Kobe Bryant, where you land and and sometimes the your teammates and your coaches and the way the ball bounces affects the perception of your career. And he also had um, you know, it's LeBron, Wade, and Carmelo. He's the only one out of the three that never made a finals, but was always lumped with those guys. They became the banana boat guys. And then he had a whole run with the Knicks where the spotlight of him being on the Knicks versus being on, I don't know, Oklahoma City or Denver or um, Orlando, it's just different. He was dissected and picked apart by a fan base in the in the biggest city that mostly liked him and still, I think, defends him in a lot of ways. But it was just the spotlight was on him in a way that doesn't match up with what actually happened in New York. Like they basically they they made it to round two once and they lost in six. Right. It wasn't like it, it was like they had this unbelievable run, but it it, it felt bigger than I think it was. Um, you're on the clock with the fourth pick, which was Toronto. And again, this is Chris Bosch all the way. I mean, interestingly, this is a draft that for the most part, with the exception of Darko, they were getting this right. I, I think Chris Bosch was right there. The fourth best pick in this draft is right where he was taken. If injuries don't shorten his career the way that they do, maybe we would be making the argument that he's above Carmelo, right? Because we we see a, a shortened career that wasn't because he was dropping off as a player, but dropping off because of the injuries that that he um that he faced. And so to me, Chris Bosch, hands down fourth best player, maybe third best player if he stays healthy his entire career. I wrote during the draft diary, he's like a young Keon Clark, only without the baggage in the bond collection. I, I was always nervous about really skinny, tall, kind of power forward center guys. The track record had not been great for those guys. And Tweener, tweener-ish. Yeah. yeah, it's like, all right, well, this guy's just going to get, you know, moved around by basically anybody. He turned into an awesome player. Um, 11 all And an awesome guy. Awesome, yeah, awesome person, it, too. Incredible teammate. Uh, one of my favorite people to do a podcast with. Made one second team all NBA. His last five Toronto years... He was 23 and 10, 50% field goal. A little like Carl Anthony Towns in that an awesome guy to have on your team, but if he's your best guy, you're probably not a 50-win team. Like he just, you know, there was that one missing chip with him. In the Miami playoff years, four postseasons for them, two, uh, four finals, two titles. He was 15 and seven. They just, you know, they, they relegated him to third banana status. He had this interesting you know, post LeBron season when he started having the blood clot issues, but was the guy on that Miami team, you know, and it was, it was a kind of an older version of Wade. And then, um, and then obviously, uh, Bosch seeming like at the tail end of his prime and he was, you know, a 22 point a game guy again, and a guy who as the league evolved and, and three point shooting bigs became more important was ahead of the curve. Cause that's how Miami was using him. I, I feel cheated because I really think he would have had an awesome kind of second half of his career as a way better version of Sam Perkins in the 90s, basically, right? I, I agree with all that. And the, the other thing I'll say about Chris Bosch, what sort of player that's doing as well as he's doing in Toronto says, I'm not going to be second banana. I'm going to be third banana. 
to LeBron James and Dwayne Wade. How many players have the humility to re- to move down in status that far and be 15 and 7 when it's clear when LeBron leaves he goes back up to 22 and, and 10 that he was that sort of player because he wanted to win championships and he wanted to play with those guys. I think that's an underrated part of Chris Bosh being more about winning, more about playing the game the way that he wants to play and enjoying himself than stuffing stats and and being perceived as an individually great player. He wanted to be perceived as a champion and and he made that decision. I think it was controversial at the time for his for his career. And I, I admire him for it. I think Clay Thompson's like that. I think so. And I think there's been other guys over the years that, you know, Mikhail and Parrish were like that to some degree where Mikhail would have been, Mikhail was a top five guy at his peak and, and, and any of their team, he's the best guy. And, you know, you kind of accept like, this is an awesome situation. We might be able to win titles here. Um, Bosch and Clay, I feel like we're, even though their games had nothing in common, I think they had a lot in common for kind of what they sacrificed just to be in the spotlight. I forgot to mention with Dwayne Wade, it is a fun what if if Miami takes Chris Kamen there because the next pick is the Clippers and you could have had Dwayne Wade going to the Clippers for the 3 4 season, which was the last Shaq and Kobe season. And... I don't know. I, I I just feel like he was so good. I don't think there's any team that he wouldn't have succeeded on, even a team as dysfunctional as the Clippers, right? And they had some talent in that 3 4 season, those mid-2000s Clippers teams. They finally made a run in 06, but like Elton Brand was there already. You know, they still, I think they traded Darius Miles for Andre Miller that summer, but, um, but they, they, that he actually could have maybe flipped the Clippers around. We might've had a Dwayne Wade Kobe thing because, and I've said this before, I still think Dwayne Wade's 09 season was greater than any Kobe season. He's 35 and eight, 30.4 PR, which is ridiculous for a guard from 05 to 11. He was 27, five and seven in the playoffs from 05 to 2012, their first title or second title, 26, six and five, um, two first team on base, three seconds and three thirds. And honestly, he should have made first team over Kobe in 2011. So um, it's it's a pretty, the Clippers have had a lot of what ifs over the years, 98 that could take guys. But that's one where if Riley just screws up, their, their next 15 years are completely different. And that's the draft in a nutshell right there. And it was really close. Yeah. They were really close to screwing up. And, you know, it's from their standpoint, it was Wade all the way. But at the time, it wasn't. And, and this no. is 2020 hindsight vision that even teams that hit home runs, they're very close to striking out. Very, very close sometimes. The line is very thin. Yeah. All right. Number five pick, ironically, Miami, which is why I want to talk about that. Because uh, taking Wade, they end up winning the title a couple of years later. And then he ends up luring LeBron. And it makes the next 12 years for them. I have them... So here's some guys on the board just for people living at home. There's uh, David West, Boris Diaw, Kyle Korver, Josh Howard, Kirk Heinrich, Mo Williams, Leandro Barbosa, Kendrick Perkins, Michael Pietras, TJ Ford. I am taking West. He you ended up to. going. He ended up going 18th in this draft. He just was really good. I mean, you go look at his career from 06 to 14. He's 18 and eight. His 08 New Orleans team was really competitive as a playoff team. You know, they're like a fringe contender. And then on those Indiana teams in 13 and 14, especially, you know, they were going toe to toe with Miami. That was a top four team in the league and awesome guy. I know when he went to Golden State later in his career was a really important veteran guy for them. And I, I, everyone just speaks glowingly of that dude from every stop he's ever been in. Seems like a logical fifth pick. Another guy that suffered from he wasn't a high school senior. He wasn't a freshman and he wasn't an international player. And at the time, there was just a fairly severe bias against players that had proven themselves in college. It was one of these weird situations, I think, where like if you weren't drafted sooner, there must be something wrong with you. And so we're not going to take you now either. And Danny Granger exactly. was like that West too, remember? was everything he was in college. Yeah. In Danny Granger, 
Indiana had a whole team of those guys because Danny Granger was another one. He fell to 19 and it was, it was stupid. So West was a guy for his career. He averaged 0.23s a game, 26.5% from threes for his career. Just didn't take him. He was a mid range guy, a kind of guy that doesn't really exist anymore. And I, I wonder like, Oh, three David West coming into the league in 2020. They're pr- he's, they're probably making him shoot 1200 threes a day. You got to forget this mid range stuff. You got to stretch out. And I think he would have had a different career. I like this version of West. I, I thought he was a bad motherfucker. Like he, he was one of those dudes that, uh, you know, you wanted him on your side, especially in a playoff series when it got tough. All right. The clips are on the clock at number six. And for the record, we've had a drop off. I think now it's like anything's possible. I don't know what you're going to do. Let's see it. Well, we, we dropped off already after, after Wade, Bosch, LeBron, Carmelo. I mean, there was a drop yeah. as good as West was. I don't think he's in that. I like to talk about draft tiers. I don't think he was in that tier. No, he but was in his I own think, tier. Yeah. He's like right, by there's, himself there's, in that tier. There's tier one. There's tier two in that tier sits one person, right? Which is, uh, which is West. Yeah. I, I debated this a lot about what I'm going to do here with the next guy on the board. And I think there's a lot of guys that you could argue for. I just went with Kyle Korver. Much, tra- uh, much traveled. And his basketball reference page is hilarious. It's just, it, it's, it's like, as long as the Bible, he's, he had all these stops, he's traded in mid season, but man, Talk about somebody that translates to the current era. He could shoot it, the basketball. One of the great, greatest shooters in the last couple of decades. Averaged 25 minutes a game throughout his career because he could really shoot the basketball. Ashton Kutcher lookalike. 51st pick in this draft. He's spent a few years in Philly, goes to Utah, goes to Chicago, Atlanta, ends up with LeBron in Cleveland, back to Utah. And then uh, Milwaukee. But yeah, for his career, I was shocked because this is kind of atypical for guys from this area. It's 43% for his career. And this is da- dating back to 03, like 38% with a high was volume, awesome. With a high yeah. volume of threes. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't think he's a Ray Allen type when we talk about the greatest three-point shooters ever because he was really a specialist. But I think as far as specialists go, Uh, One of the best ones. I had him seventh on my board. So I'm going to take the guy who I had sixth on my board. Might surprise you. It's another international guy. Okay. Boris Diaw. So I'll make the case for Boris. And this is how I look at this stuff. By the way, this pick would have been for Chicago. Um, We saw Boris at his best making meaningful contributions to teams that had a chance to win the title. And in 2014 actually did win the title, but I was shocked by his, his stats on the Oh six Suns, the year that, uh, Amara Stoudemire got hurt and he's basically, he's playing center and he's this young guy. They got the Joe Johnson trade. They don't know. They don't really know him. He put up a 19, seven and five in the, in the 2006 playoffs in 20 games. And this is against the best, the West was better in the East that year. Um, he had that run. And then in San Antonio, especially in 14, was really a problem. You know, he was somebody that had learned to stretch the floor a little bit. He could play. I thought he was a really good defender. He was a beloved teammate and was a guy that battled with weight. And, you know, that we made all made fat jokes about him, fat Boris, all that stuff. He would kind of come and go from a shape standpoint. But I don't know. I, I just, for what I'm getting here and, and how unique he was and the fact that I can play him as my stretch five and fit him in and play him with all kinds of teams. I can play him with any team that loves to move the ball and he's going to fit in because he was such a good basketball player. Uh, I, that's what I'm taking. And that's what the, that was the seventh pick, right? Or six? Yeah. Seven. Seventh pick. So you're up at eight. Averaged eight and a half points a game. That's, I know. That's the drop off we're talking about. You know, I saw him. And he was teammates with Michael Pietras in France. They were on the same team. And I traveled to France to watch them play together. And, you know, Jao went 21, Pietras went 11. And everyone thought because of the athleticism and the fact that Pietras was a classic 
two guard who could shoot the ball, who could get to the basket, where Boris was such an odd, odd player, especially back then. It was hard to pigeonhole him even in France. Like, what is he? What is, what is he going to be? It's just really interesting that here you could watch them on the same team and and be so wrong about who was going to end up being in the league for 14 years and and who was going to wash out of the league. Well, Petrus played 10 years, actually, which is surprising. Had a couple of nice really, runs. Yeah. Oh, nine magic. Ne- he was he was weirdly important. Yeah. But never really lived up to what we thought he would be. I just look okay, at I'm it. on the board. I, I took yeah, you're on the board. I the biggest thing for me with Dia was like, you know, like Heinrich or Heinrich. I always call him Heinrich. Heinrich, uh, Mo Williams, Barbosa. I always feel like I can just get scoring guards who can't who, you know, flawed scoring guards or in Heinrich's case, a really good defensive player. Um, it's just harder to find a guy like Dio a guy who can play the four and the five and is so malleable. I I really respected when he was at his peak, what, what he could do. All right. You're in the clock for uh, eight. It was Milwaukee. If you remember, there was another draft story this night. One that got me in a lot of trouble. Michael Jordan was trying to buy uh, the bucks. Wow. That night. And they thought that there was a deal in place at the time for Jordan to 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 own the Bucks, and one of the reasons they were pushing this was that Jordan wanted to make this draft pick for Milwaukee, but the Bucks weren't going to let him make the draft pick unless this deal was done. And of course, it falls apart a day or so later. I think that Michael Jordan actually, in the long list of bad Michael Jordan draft picks, I I believe. I had sources in Milwaukee at the time swear to me that they went ahead and drafted the guy that Jordan wanted at eight, which was TJ Ford out of Texas. And that was clearly not the right guy. Injuries really, really stunted his career, though he wasn't bad uh, before before all of those injuries. Uh, it's funny, though, that like, if you look at the next few guys that go in the real draft, Mike Sweetney, Jarvis Hayes, Pietras, Nick Collison, Marcus Banks, Luke Ridnour, Reese Gaines, Troy Bell, our guy Kabarkapa. Um, it's a disaster. Yeah, TJ Ford, there was a couple of years there where, uh, I don't know, he was something. He just, he took one of the, I was, I, I think I was watching the game when he got hurt just randomly. Uh, he took one of the worst falls in a game I can remember. I think they wheeled him out like a, like a football receiver. Oh, there was stretcher and stuff. And I, he was never the same after that. Oh, they were worried that there was like, maybe even like paralyzed. He was going to be paralyzed. Yeah, paralysis. Yeah. Yeah. So who would you take in this spot? I think I'd take Heinrich. There's not a, a slam dunk choice here, but he plays for Kansas, first of all. So that's, yeah, that's obviously going to help. You love the Kansas book. guys, right? I love, I love all the Kansas guys. He was a gritty defender. He shot 37, uh, 37 and a half percent from three throughout his career. But at this point in the draft, when you look at everybody else below him, that really is a role player. Kirk Heinrich was passable as a starting point guard in the NBA. He had a really nice run there in the mid 2000s and his stat, not only were his stats good, if you go back you're, you know, the, the kind of thing you'd want from your point guard, like the 15 and five, he could make three stuff like that, but he's an excellent defensive defensive player. And I think that's, that's, um, maybe what the difference is between him and like the Mo Williams or the Leandro Barbosa where Heinrich could actually guard people. I had, uh, in the eight spot, um, I had Josh Howard, so I'm going to take him ninth. So I know it, I know it flamed out fast. We, we, we're still, it's the 30 for 30 that never happened. But from 06 to 09, he was 18, six and five, made an all-star team. He was the third best guy on a team that made the finals in 06. And in 07 had the best record in the league. He was the prototypical three and D guy, great athlete. Um, the kind of guy that in 2020, everybody wanted and he kind of, he kind of screwed it up and his career wasn't as good as it should have been. But for those four Dallas years, last one, maybe not as great, but, um, 
he was really valuable and they, there weren't a lot of guys like him in 2006. It's a, it's a great choice if you're looking at the talent, right? But then if you look at the impact in his career, because his career was cut short, the number of minutes he ultimately ends up playing in the NBA, what have you, then it, then it's a little bit more questionable. But right from a talent standpoint, when he was on, he probably deserved to even go a few spots higher than, than you drafted him. Yeah. I'll, I'll just take four good years of them and then I'll send them packing. All right. Okay. So that pick was for the New York Knicks, ironically. The number I think 10 this, pick. Leandro Barbosa. I was watching. You want to talk about the, the early Giannis. You were watching Leandro Barbosa in Brazil. His mixtapes were unreal. It was some of the funnest mixtapes I've ever seen. I had a, an agent from Brazil sending me these tapes. I was getting them in the mail. That tells you the difference in, in time. And I watched them at ESPN and, and get a circle of people around me when I was watching Barbosa. And all of us were cheering, were laughing. I mean, this guy was awesome. And it was also clear that the level of talent he was playing against was like YMCA level talent at times as well. And no idea and had such a strange game and a weird shot. And it was herky jerky. No idea. If you would have asked me on draft night, what's Barbosa going to be in the NBA? I didn't have a clue, but I just knew that I loved watching him play basketball. And he did the same thing in workouts. It, it, Teams loved him and the high energy thing. And he turned out to be a, a, a really nice six man who could really score the basketball, shot the ball well um, from three throughout his career, and actually definitely overachieved his draft where he was drafted, but I think dramatically exceeded any expectations that anybody in the league really had towards who he was going to be as a basketball player. Yeah, 06 playoffs. Second year in the league for the Suns, he's 14 a game in 20 playoff games and 39% from three. His threes kind of came and went as his career went along. I think I remember him as being a better three-point shooter than the stats say, but he definitely was one of those instant offense guys. It's interesting, though. You go back to the draft. He got drafted by the Spurs, 29th. The Spurs thought they had a chance to sign Jason Kidd, remember? The uh, heading into... um the oh the July 2003 free agent thing and that was the whole thing are they going to keep Tony Parker sign Jason Kidd keep them both trade Tony Parker but they're trying to clear cap space for him so they draft him and they trade him to Phoenix for a 2005 first round pick that became David Lee because they don't want his salary on you know they they want as much cap they don't want his cap hold any of that stuff he would have been a really fun imagine him on the Spurs with him, Parker, and Ginobili all together. Greg oh Popovich God. would have strangled him to death. He wouldn't have lasted. Yeah, probably. He, he would have physically been dead his first season. The way he played would have, no way with Greg Popovich could he have coached Barbosa. Nash loved him. That was one of, that was another teammate that Nash always like raved about, like just incredibly skilled guy, heat check guy, um, super fun. All right, so I'm on the clock at 11. I can't believe you fell this far. Mo Williams. From 05 to 11, he was 16 and 5, 41% from three, a little ahead of his time. Second best guy on uh, the 09 Cavs that really could have made the finals if Orlando was just the worst matchup at the worst time for them. And, hey, you know, had some Clipper stuff and uh, had a pretty good career. He was, you know, never was sure what position he was. He always thought he was a little bit better than maybe he was, but was a guy that definitely wasn't afraid of big moments and things like that. And uh, I don't know. I enjoyed him. I never thought I'd hear the phrase, I can't believe Mo Williams slid this far. Slipped to 11. Yeah. Well, he went 47 in real life. So there you go. All right. We're heading to uh, the end of the, the we're, we're, we're scrapping now. Number number 12, you're up. We are so scrapping right now. I'm like looking at the board like, are you kidding me? Who am I, I going to take here? What about James Jones? Wow, he wasn't on. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't one of my guys. Long career. Shot forty percent from three. Wow, through his career, beloved teammate, beloved teammate, guarded multiple positions, 
was considered a glue guy throughout his career. And now he's the general manager of the Phoenix Suns. So you want him just, you're looking at 10th men right now. Is there anybody you're, that you think's better than a 10th man right now at 13? That's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, he was a career 40% shooter from three. I'm looking at uh, his playoff stats. Playoffs. 09 for Miami. Oh, I was only one series. Yeah, he never got a ton of shine. I, I had Perkins in this spot. Um, he went 27th in the draft, but was a guy that, you know, he was a center on a team that won the title. He, that 08, 09, 2010 run in 2010, he gets hurt six minutes into game six, swings that series. I still think they were going to win that series if he doesn't get hurt. He just got hurt at the worst possible time. And, and, you know, at his best was a double, double guy, good defender, tough guy protected his teammates. I think people tend to remember OKC post Jeff green trade where they always had to throw him the ball the first four minutes and he would take a terrible jump hook. And it was always like, why is he out there in crunch time? They should be going smaller. He's slowing them down, but he had a good career and was in a lot of playoff games. So I, I'm happy to get a center at 13th that I can throw out there for 20 minutes a game. I'll platoon him with Boris Dio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're uh you're on the clock. By the way, in real life, the teams the teams in the lottery here was Washington was number number 10, Golden State 11, Seattle 12, RIP, Memphis 13 and Seattle 14. So, you're on the clock now for what what this is Oh, this is the last pick. Last pick of the lottery. Can I select Darko Milicic here? Yeah. Upside. I like it. I took Jay Williams in the 2002 draft with the last pick. Same thing. Upside. Maybe, maybe, maybe he does get out of motorcycle in the second time we do this. Upside. No pressure now as the 14th pick in the draft. Yeah. You know, you look at, you look at Darko's averages and they're, they're poor, but some of it, you have to take out all those Detroit games where he didn't really play, but other than a few minutes, a game. There were some really nice years in Orlando, some decent years in Memphis, where this guy not only had potential, he was a he was a good basketball player. His career obviously never panned out the way that we wanted it to or that I wanted it to. But at 14, and you look at all the other guys on the board, you tell me that you'd rather have Steve Blake or Luke Ridnauer or Matt Bonner or Chris yeah. Kamen. Yeah, we had a Co Jose Calderon, Luke Walton, Marquis Daniels. I think Pietras, there's a mild case here just because we saw him contributing to a playoff team. But I'm with you. With pick 14, plus just for the comedy, you got to take him. Maybe, maybe if we roll the dice 10 times with Darko, there's a version where he falls to 14 and it's a fucking awesome pick. So in real life, the, the team would have been uh, the Seattle Supersonics. It would have been with Ray So headline Allen. for this whole redraft is Chad Ford once again selects Darko yeah. <laughs> You know how much crap I got from Pistons fans who somehow think that I'm the reason that the Pistons drafted Darko Milicic number two? That This is the most incredible thing for everybody that thinks that I'm an idiot. That I They also believe that weirdly I had the power over Joe Dumars to select this pick on his behalf for for Detroit. I'm not saying that I wouldn't have taken him too, because I think I would have, but it's really interesting how people come back and blame me for the Pistons screwing up this draft. It's like they were only reading my draft coverage and they didn't have international scouts or they didn't work this guy out or do all this stuff themselves. They did. They loved him. Uh, as much as I have to own the fact that I love Darko and he was number two on my board, I did not draft Darko Milicic on behalf of the Detroit Pistons. All right, Chad Ford, we can listen to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board podcast. Great to have you back doing your thing again. Uh, I, I miss listening to you and, and reading. Are you, you're not doing any writing stuff yet, though, right? Not yet. It's coming. Okay. Okay, good. All right, good luck. Good to see you again. Thanks, Bill. 